Thank you so much. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I never knew scientific meetings could be so exciting, so really happy to be here to tell you about the work that we're doing in my lab at UC Santa Cruz to advance RNA liquid biopsy technology for um, cancer early detection. And so, as many of you know, um, our bodies are comprised of trillions of cells. Uh, one estimate is that there are 37 trillion cells in the human body. I don't know who counted this, but um, hopefully that's an accurate estimation. But what's really amazing is that these cells are continuously secreting information via RNA. And so these RNAs are secreted into the circulation, for example, into the blood, in extracellular vesicles, or EVs. These EVs are very tiny, they're nanometer-sized particles that protect RNA from degradation. And in fact, if you take a single milliliter of blood from anyone in this room, you'll be able to find billions of these EVs uh, within this single milliliter of blood. And so even if uh, each EV only had a single molecule of RNA, we're talking about billions of RNAs that we can profile to be able to understand what's happening in all of the cells in our bodies that comprise all the tissues and organs uh, that make up the human body. And so my lab has been really leveraging this uh, vast RNA landscape within our genomes. And so as many of you know, of the three billion base pairs that comprise the human genome, about 75% of these uh, base pairs are transcribed into RNA. But what was really quite surprising is that only one to 2% of these three billion base pairs uh, encode for proteins. And so the rest of this RNA that's being uh, transcribed within these cells are comprised of non-coding RNA. So my UCSC uh, RNA Center director and colleague, Harry Noller, likes to call this the RNA dark matter of the genome. And so we're really studying this dark matter to be able to understand disease and to be able to diagnose it at the earliest stages. And I'm sure many of you know that liquid biopsies really are an exciting way to profile what's happening in vivo using a minimally invasive or non-invasive approach. And so liquid biopsies really provide this in vivo insight into very complex diseases such as cancer. And again, this really enables molecular level profiling of different biofluids such as blood. And um, this is really the only uh, way that you can do systemic profiling of what's happening within our bodies. So if you wanted to do something equivalent uh, using, for example, a tissue biopsy, you'd have to really surgically remove a piece of tissue from every tissue and organ within our bodies to be able to uh, even come close to profiling this very complex um, RNA uh, signal that's, for example, in the circulation. And so um, we are really excited about the application of using RNA liquid biopsies, not only to understand systemically what's happening in uh, healthy individuals, in individuals who develop cancer, and other diseases, but this also really enables continuous monitoring of different dynamic uh, disease states. For example, cancer is a continuously evolving disease, right? It's very rapidly evolving. If you treat uh, patients with specific types of therapies, um, these cancer cells can develop resistance. And so this is really a way that you can profile these very dynamic changes that are happening without having to do an actual tissue biopsy. And uh, the reason why we really wanted to focus on RNA in particular is because existing DNA-based methods could potentially miss um, the earliest stages of cancer, and so we wanted to really understand um, how we can do early detection of cancer, especially because we know that uh, there are many people worldwide, there are over 20 million people uh, who are diagnosed with cancer, um, these are global estimates provided by the American Cancer Society, um, who are diagnosed around the world with cancer, and unfortunately, we know that about 10 million people died from cancer uh, in 2022 alone. And so um, the reason you know, why a lot of these cancers lead to uh, high levels of mortality is because they're detected at very late stages of disease. And so the greatest thing that we can do to uh, reduce this number is to detect cancer at the earliest stages, which is what we're trying to do with these RNA-based liquid biopsies. And so these are some stats from the United States, where if you look at, for example, pancreatic cancer or esophageal cancer, if you detect them at later stages when they've already metastasized, the five-year survival rate is incredibly low, 3% for pancreatic cancer, 6% for esophageal cancer. And so really we want to come up with better ways to do early detection when patients can receive treatment that are most likely uh, going to be uh, more effective and, and hopefully curative. And so um, we want to address this question of how can we detect cancer at the earliest stages using genomic uh, approaches or transcriptomic approaches. And so um, initially we wanted to see when you have cancer initiation, um, if you model this, for example, in a dish, uh, what is this uh, change to this vast RNA landscape, these 75% uh, of the 3 billion base pairs in the human genome that are transcribed into RNA. So we focused on one class of genes, uh, these RAS genes that are mutated across uh, many different types of cancers. So about 30% of all human cancers have uh, mutations that drive uh, this cancer formation, especially, for example, in pancreatic cancers, the vast majority of these cancers have this KRAS 
Gauss mutation, this gain of function mutation. And so we wanted to see how does this initial oncogenic hit uh, affect the output of the genome, especially in the RNA level. And so, for example, if you look at the pie chart on the right, you can see that if you look at the human genome sequence, about half of it is comprised of repeat elements, such as these retrotransposon sequences. And what's really cool is that if you look, for example, at these ALU sequences, um, these are signs. Um, that are derived um, from, for example, um, these are primate-specific elements, you could see that there's over a million of these ALU insertions scattered throughout the human genome. And so if we were to do a similar study in mouse, we wouldn't see these specific elements, these repeat elements, because these ALUs are not present uh, in mouse, for example. And so we're really interested in understanding how does this, for example, initial mutation in KRAS lead to this very profound change in the transcriptome. And so we did this study a few years back where we just took a human lung cells and we introduced a simple uh, mutation in KRAS to see what happens to these cells that undergo oncogenic transform transformation in a dish. So we see that these EVs that are secreted from these cells actually change in terms of both their size. So if you look at the size distribution plots for KRAS versus control, you can see that there's a shift in size as well as increased heterogeneity in the diameter of these um, EVs. And you also see a difference in the RNA content. And what we were really surprised to see was that the vast majority of signal that was being secreted from these cells were coming from these repeat elements. This is work that we did in collaboration with my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, Angela Brooks's lab. And so um, the model that we favor is that when you have this initial oncogenic mutation, this leads to this vast upregulation of these repeat elements, especially these transposable elements that produce these non-coding RNAs that are then preferentially secreted in these extracellular vesicles. And the great thing about this is that these RNAs are now protected from degradation once they make it out of the cell. So we wanted to see if we look at uh, patients in vivo, can we also see the same phenomenon in cancer? And so we developed this RNA liquid biopsy platform, which we call Complete-Seq, to really be able to do a comprehensive profiling of the cell-free RNA transcriptome. And so we did both uh, long read sequencing as well as short read sequencing to profile these cell-free RNAs. So we take a tube of blood, isolate the cell-free RNA. In this case, these are RNAs that are protected, again, from degradation in these extracellular vesicles. And then we did what we call a repeat-aware analysis. So we quantified all of these RNAs using a custom annotation of the transcriptome, where we're not only looking at all of the known protein coding genes, all of the known genes, for example, in the gen code annotation of the transcriptome, we're also looking at these five million repeat elements that are scattered throughout the genome. Genome, and then we're using that to quantify this cell-free RNA signal. And so uh, now we're able to get many more features uh, with which to potentially diagnose disease, but we wanted to reduce this, this feature space from about 5 million features to about 15,000 features, where we're now aggregating this signal to the subfamily level. And so when we do our machine learning models, what we're able to do is classify disease using this repeat-aware approach. Uh, and I'll show you that this uh, actually works a lot better than just looking at, for example, protein coding genes. And so in a typical uh, patient or in even a healthy individual's blood, what you see is oftentimes about 10,000 genes that are detected in the cell-free RNA, about 1,000 link RNAs, a few hundred uh, transposable element subfamilies. And so we performed um, long read full-length cDNA um, cell-free RNA sequencing um, using an, uh, a MinION uh, device, and this was in collaboration uh, with Matein Jane, who's, I believe, here in the audience. And so what we did was we took this uh, plasma, for example, from pancreatic cancer patients or healthy individuals, we generated full-length cDNA, and then we performed uh, full-length sequencing on the MinION. And so, at least to my knowledge, this is the first time that uh, we've really been able to identify the true length of these cell-free RNAs within the blood. And so the, the dogma used to be that, you know, these RNAs are all degraded, they're all really short, they're not useful, there's no full-length RNA. But when you do the experiment using uh, the nanopore platform, you can actually see that there are full-length RNAs that are polyadenylated, capped, and so we see that some of these RNAs can be up to 1,000 base pairs in length. We also see a lot of long non-coding RNAs as well. And what was really quite striking is when you look at these individual cell-free RNA molecules, and so um, I work at UCSC, so I'm obligated to show a UC Santa Cruz genome browser plot in all my talks. And so here you can see, um, for example, for plot four, at the bottom you can see the annotated gene, uh, and you can see the, the exons and the introns. And um, for most of these cell-free RNA molecules in pancreatic cancer patient blood, that um, we see uh, using the MinION, we can see, for example, that there are a lot of full-length uh, transcripts in the cell-free RNA. But what's also quite surprising is that there are these novel transcripts that are not found in healthy individuals. And so, for example, you see that um, even over 50 kb upstream of the known transcription start site for this uh, PLOT4 gene, which is significantly enriched in pancreatic cancer patient plasma, we see this upstream transcription. And so, again, this is cancer-specific, so we're really excited about this novel RNA isoform discovery that's enabled by this platform. 
platform, and we're going to use this information to be able to develop better diagnostic tests for pancreatic cancer. We also looked at um, the full-length repeat cell-free RNA. And so, for example, we see a lot of full-length cyan elements, again, coming from these million or so ALU elements, uh, these primate-specific elements that are scattered throughout the genome. And we also see here on this uh, volcano plot on the left uh, that the most significantly enriched cell-free RNAs in plasma in pancreatic cancer patients are coming from these ALU sequences. And so uh, we wanted to look at other types of cancers. Here I'm showing you an uh, example from liver cancer patient blood and also esophageal cancer. And so they all have their own distinct cell-free RNA signature where a lot of the signal is coming from these colored dots which represent non-coding RNAs or repeat RNAs, whereas the gray dots represent, uh, for example, protein coding genes. And so when we use, for example, these repeat element RNAs as additional features in our machine learning models, they perform better. So for example, if you look at the repeat uh, naive approach, in orange, so these are, um, again, uh, using just protein coding genes, for example, and you compare that to the performance of this repeat aware approach, where we again bring in these repetitive cell-free RNAs, uh, we see much better performance of these machine learning models, and especially this is pronounced for esophageal cancer, and so we wanted to do a deeper dive into esophageal cancer. And so uh, we know, for example, in the United States, about one in five adults suffer from gastroesophageal reflux disease, which can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which is a, a pre-malignant uh, condition that can also lead to esophageal cancer. And so if you remember my statistics that I showed earlier, um, when you detect esophageal cancer late, uh, when it's already metastasized, the five-year survival rate is only uh, about six to seven percent, which is extremely low. And so we wanted to develop a way that we could do early detection of esophageal cancer. And so we collaborated with uh, one of the uh, world leaders in this space, um, Professor uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald's lab at the University of Cambridge. And so they have this really amazing study, um, this OCAM study, where they've collected blood from thousands of patients here in the UK. And so we wanted to obtain some of these blood samples from esophageal cancer patients, from Barrett's esophagus-diagnosed patients, and do our complete seq RNA liquid biopsy um, platform on this to assess what are these cell-free RNAs that distinguish esophageal cancer patients from Barrett's patients, from healthy individuals. And so we also collaborated with my UCSC colleague Karen Meagles lab to do this um, on, on their Promethean P48. And so we did very deep profiling of these cell-free RNAs coming from um, these esophageal cancer patient plasma samples. And so um, one of the most striking observations was that when you look at all of the cell-free RNAs that are present within these individuals that have esophageal cancer, we were able to identify about 287,000 novel unannotated cell-free RNA transcripts circulating in the blood of these patients. And this is a very small cohort. We only looked at about 40 different patients. Um, and so even with this small pilot cohort, we're able to see that there are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transcripts that are enriched in the cancer patient cell-free RNA, whereas if you look at, for example, protein-coding-derived cell-free RNAs, we only see about 10,000 or so of these uh, protein-coding cell-free RNA transcripts. If you look at other annotated gen code biotypes, such as long non-coding RNAs or pseudogenes, you also only see about 10,000 of these, whereas, again, if you look in cancer patients, you see so many more novel transcripts, and so we're really excited about bringing these novel transcripts into our custom annotation of the transcriptome with which we can then quantify these cell-free RNAs and then do hopefully better early detection of disease such as um, not only Barrett's esophagus but also uh, esophageal cancer. And so when we look at the length distribution of these cell-free RNAs, on the top uh, plot, what I'm showing you is from healthy control blood samples, and so this is uh, the size distribution of all the cell-free RNAs, and then on the bottom, what you can see is the esophageal cancer patient cell-free RNA. And so we can see reads of up to uh, 2,000 base pairs in length, and what's interesting is that the, um, the distribution of the sizes for these cancer patients uh, in their cell-free RNA seems to be a little bit shorter, uh, and so when we uh, compare this and, and do some statistical tests on this, we see that there is a significant difference in the distributions and that cancer self-free RNAs tend to be uh, a little bit smaller. We're not really sure why mechanistically this might be the case, but this is something that we'd like to bring in as additional features, potentially an RNA fragmentomics-based approach as well. And um, the other thing that we saw when we performed differential expression of these uh, few dozen um, uh, samples that we sequenced on the Promethean, we see, for example, upregulation of mitochondria-related genes uh, in the cell-free RNA of esophageal cancer patients. But um, we really wanted to get a, a, a better picture, a more comprehensive picture of what was happening using a much larger data set. And so in the U.S., um, the National Institutes of Health has funded a lot of this research to, to do tissue-level RNA sequencing, for example, of all the healthy tissues in the human body. So this is done through the GTEx consortium. 
and also a lot of different cancer uh, biopsies. And so this is through, uh, again, the US NIH-funded Cancer Genome Atlas, where they've looked at 11,000 different patients across 33 different types of cancers. And so they've generated RNA sequencing data from over 26,000 individuals. Uh, and so we were able to mine this data to look for esophageal cancer-specific RNA signals. And again, this is coming from the tissue, not from uh, the blood. And so here, what I'm showing is another volcano plot. So on the right are all of the RNAs that are significantly enriched in esophageal cancer uh, primary uh, tissue biopsies. So this is um, in vivo, in patients. And then uh, what I've highlighted in green is all the RNA that's coming from these repeat elements. And so you can see that there are literally hundreds of these repeat-derived transcripts that are significantly and specifically enriched in esophageal cancer patients, which really will enable us to do deconvolution of all of these signals that are coming from these various tissues issues uh, throughout the body. And so here what I'm showing you is an example, again, of a UC Santa Cruz genome browser plot of, uh, for example, this is a link RNA that's highly specifically upregulated in esophageal cancer tissue in these um, tumor biopsies. And so what you can see is, for example, there are five uh, kind of well-annotated transcripts. Uh, these are the uh, transcript models that are in the genome browser. And so below that in black, you can see individual molecules, individual cell-free RNA molecules. This is, again, cDNA sequencing, not direct RNA. Um, and so you can see that there are actually three different isoforms of this link RNA that are present uh, in a single individual uh, in their blood. And so again, this is um, really quite interesting where we're able to now see uh, the true nature of these cell-free RNAs that are coming out uh, into the blood. Uh, this is another interesting example where we're seeing novel isoforms of RNA. So here you can see on the top right corner the, the standard kind of gene model for this protein coding gene. You can see that there are a lot of cell-free RNAs that uh, map perfectly to what we know is the gene model, but then there are all of these um, upstream transcription events as well. And so you can see a lot of uh, RNAs that are coming from, uh, if you look at the bottom, the repeat track here, um, you can see that there are these sign-derived, um, allo-derived RNAs that are very highly expressed in these patients, not only for uh, the known protein coding gene that's being expressed, but also for this, this novel isoform, this uh, five prime extended isoform that we see a few copies of. And also, again, you see upstream of that, this ALU signal that's being transcribed. Here's another example where we see um, a shortened three prime UTR for this coding gene in the cell free RNA. Um, we also see some interesting uh, novel transcripts that are completely unannotated, so there's not even a repeat annotation uh, that overlaps with these cell free RNAs. Um, and uh, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you a few examples. But here, again, we're seeing um, that, for example, when there are these novel isoforms in these esophageal cancer patients, and again, these are not present in the plasma of healthy individuals, we see that oftentimes when there is this aberrant five prime um, upstream transcription event, this oftentimes coincides with highly upregulated repeat RNA expression. And so here you can see, uh, for example, on the far right, where I've uh, boxed it in orange, um, there are all of these ALU-derived RNAs that are coming from this five five prime end, and also um, kind of scattered throughout this transcript as well. And so we're excited about being able to leverage this additional information. And um, this is just an example of a novel transcript that we um, identified in these patients, uh, one of the 270,000 or so novel um, unannotated cell free RNAs, where this um, particular novel transcript is coming upstream from a known uh, protein coding gene. And so again, this is uh, just from the cell free RNA of esophageal cancer patients in their blood. And so what you can see is that this um, novel transcript is comprised of two different repeat elements, an ALU element uh, that's a sign and also an LTR-derived element. And so just to kind of wrap up, we're really excited about the future of nanopore-based RNA sequencing. And really, this is the only way that you can do systemic profiling, to really gain the systemic understanding of what's happening in the context of health, in the context of different diseases in vivo. And so using, for example, uh, the Prometheon device, we're able to really do very deep profiling of these um, plasma samples to really get a better understanding of just what's happening in the context of disease. Um, we're really excited about the tremendous potential for novel cell-free RNA biomarker discovery, especially RNAs that are highly specific to a given disease. So I've shown you a few examples of, of cancer, but I've, we've also been doing other diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, where we again see many novel transcripts that are specific to Alzheimer's disease patients that are not found in healthy individuals. And then lastly, we're um, also super excited about this potential of using this handheld Minion device to provide more equitable access in, for example,
example, remote or resource limited settings where uh, we could potentially bring this um, hopefully, you know, cutting edge, uh, potentially life saving RNA liquid biopsy technology to um, individuals around the world. And so uh, we are trying this now uh, using Flongal flow cells and um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to share some of that data in the future. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of the amazing people in my lab that have contributed to this work. Um, this was really uh, initiated by a former grad student in my lab, Roman Reggiardo. Um, and now all of the Nanopore work is really being led by um, Vikas Pedu, a current graduate student in the lab. I have to thank all my amazing collaborators at UC Santa Cruz, Cambridge, and uh, at these other great institutions. And um, also, this was uh, really supported by the American Cancer Society for the, for the most part. And so we're really thankful for their support. And um, thank you so much for your attention. Happy to take questions.